This episode was brought to you by Big Moose. Find out about the One Million Project at bigmoosecharity.co. Pals, pals, greetings, greetings, and welcome to another episode of Everything Endurance. It is, as always, an absolute pleasure to be back in your ears. Um, and after only two weeks, no more random gaps of a few months. Uh, uh, we're back just two weeks after the last episode. I've already got two episodes in the bag, ready to come out over the next few weeks. So you can rely on us for a little while at least, uh, despite how unbelievably busy we are now that we're back to having a full race calendar. And I mean, that's exciting. I'm just a couple of weeks or so now away from heading out to Peru for the Jungle Ultra. Um, Another, I mean, it's been, what, nearly three years now since we've been able to head out there. And I cannot wait that's going to be absolutely brilliant and then i get back from that a few days turn around and i'm heading back out to follow the summer spine race as well which will be absolutely brilliant in its own way um so yeah things are happening thick and fast over here but we are still getting this podcast out to you uh news over the last couple of weeks we've seen john kelly smash yet another ridiculous ultra running record um he is now the holder of the fastest uh wainwright round which is Outstanding. I mean, for anyone who isn't familiar with the Wainwright round, I've done a couple of episodes on that before. Um, 214 summits, all of the Wainwright Hills around the Lake District. Um, All 214 summits, back to back, in a row. No break, just bagging summits. It's a colossal bit of running. It's an enormous amount of distance. It's an enormous amount of ascent. It's a very, very long time to be out there in that Lake District weather. Even at a good time of year like this, you're always going to get hit with something. Um, And he took 12 hours, half a day off the existing record. An existing record, which had been set by Sabrina Vergie, who is in herself an exceptional, exceptional ultra runner. So massive congratulations to you, John. You are another record to your name. Um, This record only slightly less prestigious, I imagine, than your record of being the person who has made the most appearances on this podcast. And that is a high honor indeed. Um, A tally we'll be adding to next week. Uh, We've already got the date in the diary. I'm really looking forward to talking to John. We'll have that episode out for you as soon as we can. Um, I'm going to wish good luck on this Friday the 13th. It's the 13th. I've only just looked at the date while I've been recording this. I was blissfully unaware of the bad luck that could be around me in the air right now. Hopefully it won't affect this recording or the run of this particular athlete I was about to talk about. Carol Morgan, good luck to you. She is out doing her own Wainwright round at the moment. Um, having a ba- The weather has been quite bad for her, so she, I know, is having a bit of a battle. I can't imagine she's listening to this, but Good luck, Carol. Um, I hope you have an incredible time out there. And there's more Wainwright rounding to come. Uh, Dougie Zinnis, who you'll know if you're a regular listener to the podcast, um, he has the winter double Bob Graham record, and we interviewed him on the podcast about that. Uh, In two weeks' time, he's going to go out and have a go at the Wainwright round as well. Fantastic. Can't wait. So good luck to you, Dougie. I'll be watching that dot. I will definitely be watching that dot. Um, let's move on to today's podcast, shall we? I think we should. Bit of a different one, this. I've thoroughly enjoyed this process. So, the person I'm about to uh, I'm about to speak to, or people rather, um, very recently took part in the Highland Ultra um, up on the Noidart Peninsula in the West Highlands, um, and one of them in particular, uh, Helen, has her own podcast. She is sort of my opposite number but in the triathlon world she she's the host um of the inside tri podcast which is something you should definitely listen to there's there's a fair amount of crossover here between the kind of guests she's interviewing over there and the kind of guests that i interview and there's there's plenty to be gleaned out of the inside tri show whether you're into tri or not um but yeah give it a listen this this was a really good opportunity for me to talk to somebody who was documenting the Highland Ultra themselves along the way. Um, Helen has already released her own episode about her experience, and it's been fascinating. For me, even someone who's worked behind the scenes on these races for years, it's been fascinating to listen to her episode back and and hear it presented from the inside, from the runner's perspective. Um, 
definitely head back and uh, look for her episode. I'll make sure that there's a link to it in the description underneath this podcast, wherever you're listening to. Um, Helen and her running buddy Richard came out and did the Highland Ultra podcast. Um, by all accounts, had a tremendous time. And we're going to talk to them about their experience of making that move from triathlon to ultra, the different training that was involved, the skills that they brought with them from tri to ultra, and interestingly, the things that they learned from their training and you know racing in in the ultra running scene that they will take back with them into the uh, triathlon scene that that they're much more familiar with. Um, also, towards the end of the episode, we break into just talking to Helen a little bit more about about her career as a triathlete and how she came to be the presenter of the Inside Tri Show and, and what she gets out of uh, all the podcasting she does. So uh, a warning here that there is definitely some podcaster to podcaster geekiness going on towards the end of this episode. But, you know, it's, uh, it's all interesting stuff. It's all in good humor. And I know you're going to enjoy it because they're, they're both absolutely lovely guests. So without further ado, welcome then to Helen and Richard. And how on earth are you? Really good, Ashley, I think. Yeah, I'm very well. Feeling a, a little sore after a, a local fell race last night, but otherwise, okay. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I mean, local fell race last night. Uh, my next question was going to be, are you feeling adequately rested and recuperated after the Highland Ultra? But it sounds <laughs> like you are back at it. Well, uh, I can honestly say that the uh, the 4.6 miles that we ran last night were far more brutal <laughs> than doing the Highland Ultra. <laughs> Damn it. I mean, I, c I can't believe it. I mean, Beyond the Ultimate as a running company dropped the old nothing tougher strap line a lot of years ago, but we still like to think of ourselves as people who put on quite hard races. What on earth were you running up last night? Do you want to go? <laughs> it, it, it was um, a castle, a Welsh castle twice, not just once. They sent you up it twice. Um, so, yeah, but I think the issue is the legs haven't fully recovered, yeah. but I couldn't. I couldn't turn down. Someone had just put up, oh, anyone fancy, you know, a short run on a Wednesday night? And I thought, yeah, Rich, should we do it? Yeah, all right. <laughs> and in the, in the warm-up lap um, around the school field just before it started, we just did one little very slow warm-up. And I was like, oh, the legs feel a little bit delicate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that that's true. Um, and and physically, yeah, the, the legs really did take a beating over the, over the course of that long weekend. But... I think, but for me in particular, it was it was the poor quality sleep over the three days as well that that really layered on the fatigue onto the body. So it was it wasn't just the physical fatigue; it was it was very much that kind of all over. Just I really need to just eat and sleep now and and try not to do very much. Yeah, you've you've segued very much into uh, an area that ultra runners will be very very familiar with, which is, or two areas really: eating and not getting enough sleep. Um, and the, the cumulative effect of the lack of sleep is it does seem to do more long term damage a lot of the time yeah. than the battering you're giving your feet over a course like that. And which I guess that. Well, that's it. Sorry, everyone who's listening at home. We've leapt straight into Highland Ultra, and I'm not going to hold back now. I've got some momentum <laughs> going. Um, so how was that for you? You Do you guys come from a background being more triathlon-oriented, where you'd experience that kind of sleep deprivation, you know, accumulating overnight after night during an event? Oh, well, so I would say I, I come, yeah, more recently, definitely from more of a triathlon background. But over the last few years most summers we've done like some long distance cycling so but we've always stayed in b and b's so it hasn't been camping so we've always got that good night's sleep in the evening and we've always had pretty much some kind of alcoholic beverage in the evening <laughs> and usually like a big pizza and pudding and everything like that so you're getting the calories in definitely but for me with the highland ultra being uh, three long days on my feet no, I hadn't done anything like that before, apart from Duke of Edinburgh, but come on, that's years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And for, for me, similar. I mean, I, my my sporting background was as a rugby player going back into university days. So I, I ran about 100 metres every time and, and it was very different trying to make that transition to firstly the shorter triathlon distances and then I've only ever gone up to what's known as the middle distance. 
um, and never ever done a full Ironman. Uh, that's just not not something that it excites me. So when you say um, middle distance, what what? Because I know what an Ironman is, and you know what? Quickly for the benefit of anyone listening to this who is strictly ultra running and and somehow hasn't bumped into somebody that's familiar with Ironmans, what distances are we talking about there? So for um, for middle distance, which is what Richard just said, that mm. would be a one point nine k swim a 90k on the bike and then 21k run so a half marathon to finish off with and then the full ironman is basically double all of that so it is a 3.8k swim um 180k on the bike and then 42k to finish off with and obviously you do it one after the other so just one day one long day no but I've, I've never done one of those um but in terms of sort of like the multi day stuff um i've done multi-day hiking before in some some pretty nice places um and carrying all your kit on your back so that crossover in terms of mountainous terrain kit on your back self-sufficiency i'd got some idea of how that was going to play out for for the highland but in terms of actually trying to then run it i'd never put that into the equation before <laughs> yeah yeah, there you go. And, you know, you mentioned you might do back-to-back -back days out on the hills or whatever, but it's a bit different if you're going to an Airbnb of the evening or yeah. you are lying in an S-shape between the Tussocks and Deerpoo in a field up in the Highlands of Scotland. Like, if you're one of the unlucky people that happen to get a tent that has a boulder underneath it, then you'd, <laughs> it's about quality of sleep as much as it is about the time you actually get to spend in your tent. You might have bought yourself enough time to have 10 hours lying flat on your back, but that's not necessarily quality rest. No, that's very true. And with, with the number of competitors in, in that campsite as well, people coming in at different times of the night and yeah. locating tent mates or, um, you know, not not being able to, to whisper quietly or just having that kind of general campsite chat, that, that all factors in as well. And as you say, well, you know, you might be, you might have got back to your tent in great time, lying down, trying to get a good bit of sleep, and you just simply can't get it. Yeah, and speaking very specifically about this event, I heard about the near hurricane that suddenly blasted through your campsite <laughs> at the end of the first stage. And yes. on that particular night, I was 14 miles away in Inverie, sleeping in my bunkhouse, looking out at the stars from the window and listening to the sea, and it was perfectly calm you could have heard a pin drop mm -hmm. the next morning i ran down to the sea recorded a little bit to camera just to let the guys at home know what was going to be going on and was talking about how lovely the weather is and then i got the messages from your campsite being like that marquee is blown into pieces there was a gale here last <laughs> night like, like, oh. holy crap yeah, yeah I, I remember i was talking about that marquee on the evening it was fully there the following morning that i mean there really was no marquee it was it was an open air marquee yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, there was there was some very very quick dismantling work that the crew had to do overnight as the wind got stronger and stronger. So I I imagine that kept quite a few people awake that night. Yeah, I I just think on average you think we probably got I don't know two to four yeah. hours a night of of good sleep. Of good sleep. And after I guess after you've done a big physical day, that's where it all adds up, doesn't it? Or doesn't add up because you're not getting enough of it. And I think for for me, when we got back home after the race the the week after the race like normally quite naturally i'd wake up at about six and i'd be naturally waking up at more like i don't know seven quarter by seven so i just knew i was knackered and the first couple of days i couldn't get enough food in me yeah <laughs> agree yeah i bet and it is it's it's that cumulative damage isn't it yeah. i i also, I'm I'm loving this for the for the people who are very much you know of a tri background and have come here for Helen Murray. They're listening to the ins and outs of what multi day endurance racing is like <laughs> and being like, oh god, that sounds rough. Whereas you know, talking about the Ironman before, the guys from an endurance back, uh, you know, r running background that I'm used to talking to, alongside me are like, you did what? Like you, you cycled how far it's it, it's it's weird but they are very different extreme challenges for different reasons and i'm i'm already really enjoying sort of picking into what you found to be the challenging aspects of this event oh, the downhill <laughs> particularly on day two day two's downhill day the two final downhill. downhill into camp <laughs> I'm going to take a, a guess here, you know, as the uninitiated, that generally triathlons aren't that lumpy. 
Yeah. Oh, you say that. It depends. There, okay. there are, I'm here to be stood corrected. There, there, there is a, a seemingly a growing trend for the more extreme long distance triathlon. Um, clearly, the most famous brand is Ironman, um, but the there are others which do some really really cool events in really cool places. Um, I'm thinking of things like the Norseman and um, the Keltman and, and various other ones. They, they take the same format of the long swim, the long bike and the long run, but then put them into, um, well, in, um, in Keltman, well, Norseman, you end up running up a mountain, yeah. um, oh, wow. having, having jumped off a ferry in the middle of a fjord and then swam to shore. I mean, it's the same format, but just ramped up a bit. Yeah, but, but I, I think... Um, well, have we done such downhills in a triathlon? No, but but have I been used to the fatigue in the legs? Definitely. Uh, okay, fair yeah. enough. This is good. We're getting to the crossover. <laughs> um, so for those, cause I have jumped in here and been quite erratic with the directions I've gone in. Let's let's go back very slightly here. We're talking about difficult downhills. <laughs> what sort of terrain were you faced with in the Highland Ultra? What what was the course like? Um, I think that the first first day eased you into the the whole event. It, it started off with what can only be described as a, a relatively flat half marathon loop, which took you out along the peninsula, um, along some paved road, um, over a couple of lumps, and then picked you up onto some trail um, to bring you back down to Inverie. And that trail incorporated some bog, but compared with some of the peak district bog with which we were training earlier in the year where neither of us are very tall and um, <laughs> and that bog pretty much came up to my middle um this, this was nothing in comparison um yes you got your feet wet but you know it, it was it was doable and and you could move quite swiftly through that section and then having come back to Inverie you then took off on a, a loop up um i forget what the lock's called is it something locking yeah lock um, on. and and you you sort of followed the the lock up on a, a gradual upward trend that that then spiked you over the over the shoulder and then dropped you down the other side to another lock which we then ran along and um sorry that's lock on that, the second one yeah yeah and, and the second lock just never seemed to finish it just carried on and on and on and on the profile that we'd been sent Again, it looked it looked relatively undulating, but I can tell you, <laughs> hand on heart, that there were some real stingers of climbs and descents in that in that long section to lead you up to camp two. Um, but yeah, look, day one was probably the ease you in gently day, um, and day two then really tested the legs because the terrain got bigger, um, the gradients got steeper, the the vistas got broader i mean day two was a spectacular day in the mountains it really was um you just i couldn't couldn't really take my eyes off the scenery on day two it was absolutely fabulous yeah you guys covered it well on your podcast about this as well that the weather that you guys had on this race was incredible i mean it posed its own challenges obviously but i've never seen anything like it none of us expected a shortage of sunscreen to be the problem that most runners no, were having no, out on the course th there was so none the to be had in you my must have got on that second no no one needs it up there you know? <laughs> I, I think well i put it in i was being prepared and um but i was preparing myself for three days of driving rain and then when we just had wall-to-wall -wall sunshine it was just, it was magical. And I think it made it even more special. So I, I did pack a little sun cream and I even reapplied it one day. Oh, I could wow. just tell I was burning. Yeah, factor 30 as well, had to be reapplied. <laughs> Man, you're absolutely right about it, bringing its own challenges though. I mean, I, I'm a fairly heavy sweater and come the end of each day, I, I literally could not drink enough water at the end of each stage to actually get my body back working properly and i've been drinking all day you know filling up in the rivers every single chance to take on water i was taking on water and downing a bottle and carrying another full one with me when i left and i think on day two probably had one wee and yeah <laughs> you know it was so dehydrated it, it was it's ridiculous yeah yeah well you're welcome 
Um, it could have been three days of driving rain. We decided exactly. that. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I was I was loving the uh, April sunshine of the Scottish April sunshine. It was it amazing, was, yeah, absolutely fabulous. And on the third day, um, coming back down into camp, we tried to guess what the temperature would have been, and yeah. it, it must have been nudging twenty degrees in, in, oh, the, yeah. shel- in the shelter without the wind. It, it was properly warm. Felt like a bit a bit of an oven on that on the last long sort of stretch. It, it did feel like it went on a very long way but yeah the blue skies just really reflected off the turquoise water and it was yeah it was fab and I don't that would put me off going and doing it again because of the amazing weather I think and it would I just don't think it would ever match up to that I'd agree with that I think we saw it in its best light absolutely Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely. You know, speaking to sort of Pete Aitken, our head medic, was mm. saying that he's been a lifeboatman in that area, you know, a, a very decent chunk of his adult life. And he'd never been able to see so far across into the Isle of Skye as, as we could from our start line, way across the water at Inverie. Mm-hmm. And it, it, yeah, it, we, we did. We got once in lifetime conditions. And I really can't wait to see the runners who come along next year who've signed <laughs> up off the back of seeing all these beautiful sunny photos only to find that it's not the Caribbean. <laughs> it is the West Highlands of Scotland. This was all a ploy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, good stuff. Uh, but it, you mentioned there that even the bits that on the elevations look like gentle undulations, they're actually quite severe technical climbs at time. And, yeah. you know, I, did, I know the section of the course you're talking about. I did it last year just as a photographer with my camera kit on my back. And I was knackered by the end of that stretch. It is never ending. Yeah. Uh, and that was that's what we consider to be one of the flatter parts of the course. Day two is is that magnified oh, a few dozen times. I, I, well, I love day two. Yeah. I'm I've, so glad. I felt, <laughs> I know. So after day one, I felt a little bit broken personally. And I didn't have a whole load of energy when we got back to camp. And I just felt, I don't know if I just, I felt my feet really hurt because it was quite... Um, I want to say sort of shaly, a lot of rocks weren't there, mm-hmm. and and the constant bashing. Honestly, by the time every it, it almost felt like every time I put my foot down, it really hurt. And I had gone over on my ankle a couple of times early on. So really, day one, I was thinking, oh, I'm not feeling great, and I was a bit worried when I walked over to probably get my boiling water in the morning on day two, and I thought, oh, I can't even walk properly. Like this is going to be interesting, isn't it? But you get going and. Actually, it turned out I felt brilliant on day two. And I don't know, I felt really good going up all the climbs because there are three big climbs on day two, aren't there? Yeah. I felt really strong. On the second one, there was a, a guy called Matt just in front of me. And I got up to him and I was like, do you want my poles? <laughs> and he said, uh, no, 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 it's all right. No, 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 you can have my poles if you want. Do I really look like I'm struggling that much? Take my poles. <laughs> And then having given him her poles, shot off to the top of the mountain, with, you know, leaving everyone else for dead. I loved it. And then it just then got to that descent. But yeah, day two, did some good elevation on that day, wasn't there? Big day. Yeah. And yeah, felt felt really good. And I guess if we go then back to an Ironman, that would be similar, that you can go through, okay, we did it over the three days, didn't we? And you have good parts and bad parts which is the same in any ultra run same in a triathlon you can be feeling great and then you can have a real blip on the bike or something or maybe a a whole 5k chunk of of the run and you're just feeling rubbish but then you can come out the other side of it and feel good again yeah yeah i I guess more opportunity to do that in in an event like this a triathlon very obviously split into three parts but your transitions are fast you know your transitions seem like a part of the process i suppose it would have been more accurate to say there that the idea is that your transitions are fast (laughs) correct you know and you know i've heard try people talking about this and having to accumulate techniques for being able to get in the right gear and get on the bike as fast as possible and there are these moments in a triathlon where you reset and move on to the next thing. It's just in an event like you've just done in the Highland Ultra, that might be a 12 hour period of time overnight yeah. in yeah. which yeah. you are stopping, resetting, refueling, yeah. redoing your kit admin, talking to everyone else who was out on that stage with you and getting an idea of what their experiences were like and, and what worked and what didn't. And you can literally get up the next morning, a different person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you can, you can also uh, adapt that into the actual days it, themselves. So as I said, there'll, there'll be times when one of you's feeling good and one of you's feeling a little bit grotty, but then you run your systems checks and you go, okay, when did I last take something on as food? When did I last drink? When, you know, if, if I eat something now that will help me out and it'll instantly make me feel better because I've got some more sugar on board. And it, it's, it's really surprising. It, it doesn't take very much to just kick you out of that slump and, and keep you putting one foot in front of the other. You know, so we, we had a, a whole picnic going on, on on most of the days, you know, from sweet stuff to savory stuff, just to put that variety in. And if you, if you were fed up of having the sugary stuff, then you go and have a pepper army. And, and it's amazing that difference, that that just that different food mm. would, would make and your mood would instantly lift. And you'd be like, yeah, I can get up that next hill absolutely true amazing what a pepper army or a or a secret hot chocolate you've had stashed uh, stashed away in the bottom of your kit it's an amazing the effect that something like that can have on your day yeah it was it was a cup of soup will oh yeah <laughs> love a cup of soup I mean, it. it was a cup of soup that did it yeah, and, yeah. And the pop top what we're giving away here is that ultimately ultra running is just an excuse to eat food yeah um and i, I don't think anyone from the ultra running scene would disagree with that generally <laughs> no and it's also food that you would never ordinarily touch in your day-to-day -day life <laughs> <laughs> or not quite in the same quantities <laughs> but yeah very very true you, you wouldn't normally live on pepper army for a day no. uh, but yeah there you go you you mentioned there about what was it systems checks or or whatever it sounds quite technical <laughs> yeah no you, you basically just asking yourself are you okay you know how yes. do i feel how do I feel? How do my feet feel? How do my hands feel? Is anything rubbing? Is anything blistering? What do I need to do? And it, as I said, sometimes having gone through the bog or going, gone through the rivers, your shoes might fill up with fine grit, fine sand, and makes this really a, abrasive paste in the bottom of your shoe. And, you know, I, I got into the, the finish area and I literally worn a, a hole through my sock because because it just rubbed away with the, the fine grit that I got in and eventually those shoes went in the bin but you know it's just checking whether, whether your body feels okay whether you're hungry whether you're thirsty and and making sure that you're not necessarily sticking to a clock but being aware of how far you've covered how much time has elapsed since you last had something to eat something to drink or, or just made sure that you were feeling okay and it helps you break the time down as well you know you, absolutely you just, you just keep going one of the things i'd written down here that i wanted to ask you about was sort of things that you know from triathlons mm -hmm. that helped you when you were in this race and vice versa things you might have learned from this race that would help you the other way and we, you know we'll we'll explore that a little further but mm -hmm. what you mentioned then about system checks i, I know chris i think referred to it on your podcast an is admin an mile. admin mile yeah. um or i've i've known other people that will set aside you know five minutes in every 60 minutes for for admin and it's it's getting into that habit of making yourself think right literally how much did i drink yeah. to the closest milliliter since the last time i had an admin mile or an admin five minutes it's how many calories do i think i've taken in since then and then assessing how you feel and putting two and two together and doing what you need to do to change that am i accumulating any hot spots mm -hmm. i'm going to deal with them now during this period of time so i don't have to worry about it when it's a bigger problem later on and i imagine during something like a triathlon there's quite a lot of that going on and you've got to change that mindset from discipline to discipline that there's quite a lot of fast maths and admin checks that that you guys have to do and that that having that kind of mentality already set up from try must have helped you coming into this right definitely i think in particular on you know on a bike leg and on a run leg of a longer triathlon so anything from middle distance to then up to that full ironman distance and I mean, I would, I would be looking at my watch, making sure that I was taking something on whatever system I had in my head already. So maybe like every 20 minutes, am I eating something? Am I drinking something? And, you know, I'd be planning out the nutrition, how many calories am I going to be taking on during this event? Um, so yeah, I do think that that was very, very similar. Um, and just being really on it because you you just can't you can't blag no. a long distance triathlon um and you definitely cannot blag an ultra marathon at all at all at all so i think those two definitely 
complemented each other. And then I think a couple of the things that for me personally, that maybe I learned from the ultra compared to triathlon, one major thing um, is that I can still train for a triathlon during the week (laughs) and train for an ultra at the weekend, if that makes sense. So I was still doing two swims a week, two bikes a week, and then I'd be, we'd be on our feet for the weekend out in the hills or whatever. Um, I previously always used, not always, but once I got okay at triathlon, I would be like, I would really enjoy being competitive and being like at the pointy end of, there is a lot of age group racing. So I'd be, I'd generally be like at the pointy end of that age group, my age group racing. And with the multi-day ultra, I was like, that was not going to be happening. We were very much like middle of the pack. But again, that was really, really refreshing in that we could just enjoy it. There was no pressure. Um, I wasn't bothered about looking at pace or anything like that. So that was the big difference. And the training felt like more of an adventure and it mixed things up Mm. massively. And I loved that bit. But the, as I said, there's huge crossover. So in, in that in the week, whether it's the swim or, or the bike, you're still building that aerobic capacity. And because yeah. of the pace of, of the ultra marathon, you know, we we were never going to be the, the 15 hour cumulative finishes. That was completely <laughs> out of reach. But within that, you still have to have that decent aerobic base and, and the crossover of, of the, the tri training, the swim, the, the bike, Took, took the impact off your legs. Yep. So you were minimizing your risk of injury during the week, but you were also still keeping that aerobic base high so that when you did go and do the, the multi-day weekend back-to-backs with all your kit going up the mountains, that actually was complementary mm-hmm. rather than a, a total body shock. And I think yeah. as well, things like you know with the running right you need to have your you need to have a strong core don't you that relates to triathlon you need to have um strong legs so you can build that strength on the bike by doing um big gear work and like for the upper body you know i was doing quite a bit of in the pool stuff with paddles so again focusing on the upper body and then that would have helped me when it came to carrying that pack Mm -hmm. (laughs) and things like that. So yeah, yeah, there was lots that we could cross over between, between the two. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And then just to to round off the H's point about the nutrition um, where being very specific (laughs) with the, what you're taking on for a long, long distance try that, I mean, we, we, we looked at your recommendations for the daily calorific intake for uh, an ultra marathon. And then we, we, did quite a lot of maths and, and made sure that we were well in excess of, 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 of that recommendation purely because, you know, you, we, we factored the elevation, we factored the terrain and, and what our own body intake requires. And again, um, I mean, you're much better at it than I am, but. Oh, it's uh, eating, but also I, we. No, I'm we, good at eating. I'm, I'm not good at actually. <laughs> oh, I'm great the, at that too. Remembering <laughs> to eat. But like we did, we did a long weekend in Snowdonia and I think I took 2000 calories, which is what was the recommend recommended in the kit list, like minimum, wasn't it? Yeah. And I quickly realized, no, 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 no. Oh, I need a lot more than more. that. <laughs> we are going to have to look at that because a couple of people came across it. It's, it's very much, this is the minimum yes. we will allow you to pass kit check with. But we had quite a lot of people come back to us going, oh, how am I supposed to do that on 2000 calories? You're not. You're not. <laughs> you're not and you can't. That, <laughs> well, that, and, and you also just need to know your own body as well yeah you need to you, know what you, you need. might if you are right at the sticky end of this and you're an elite runner and you're going to be knocking this course off in four hours you might be able to get away with a calorie yeah. intake that low but that doesn't mean we think you should try it mm-hmm. no. yeah uh, but yeah yeah there you go um i'll rewrite the race pack before next year <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys figured it out and brought some extra pepper armies along because yeah a lot of calories get burnt out there you mentioned as well that um and was i guess this was something you tucked in specifically to prepare yourself for this for the highland ultra was you've got your sort of try training that can be sort of quite gym based and you know can fit in during your week yeah. 
But then you're going out and doing these back-to-backs. You mentioned looking for areas that were similar so you could go out into a bog. And I guess that's part of the difference is you can't train yourself in a gym during the week to know what it feels like to walk another six hours over big lumpy hills after you've been up to your waist in a peat bog. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's it's that kind of exposure to the elements that you can only train for by spending a lot of time out in those elements. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so would was it that that sort of changed your training a little bit? Is it just trying to prepare yourself for that accumulated time on feet? Yeah, I think so, and I, I think we we were both well aware that it if if you did a, a big a big day on let's say a Saturday, in order to try and get close to replicating the experience of the Highland, we'd need to go out and do another big day on the Sunday. So typically we'd probably do um, run walking with packs on, on the one day and with the extended distance, yeah. and then maybe just um, pole hiking with the packs for the, for the second day. But that is that cumulative time on feet that we were looking to replicate. And then we're, we're lucky to live quite close to um, some of the, the North Welsh mountains. We're, we're not too far from Snowdon and Snowdonia. We're not too far from the Berwins. We've got various other things on our doorstep. And over the course of the winter, you know, this, this event was a great, um, oh, almost like a carrot on a stick yeah. for us to go and explore what's on our doorstep. And and because we knew we, we would need to go in all weathers and be ready for all weathers, given where the, where the event was taking place, we would go out in all weathers. You know, there, there was one, one Saturday morning we got in the car and drove over to the office dike path. And as we drove out, the temperature gauge went from a relatively balmy three degrees to below zero. The snow came down and we both sat in the car. Went, do we really want to do this? this? This looks horrible. But off we went and we had three hours in the snow and the slush and the mud. And, and once you're out there, then, then it's, it's okay. Fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we did try and replicate the the cumulative effect and, and the the weather as much as we possibly could. We didn't we didn't we did not manage to replicate three days of backpack sunshine. Will no, nope. no, no. We, that would have been difficult anywhere in days. the UK. Yeah. No, but uh, you know what you were doing was those back to back weekends, and yeah. that's something that we say to almost anyone that signs up for one of our events. You got to think uh, our events predominantly are like five days plus. Yeah. Um, but we we understand people have lives and it's not easy repeatedly in the training leading up to an event for you to just have five days out. We wouldn't expect you to do that. Also, if you go out and spend five consecutive days training in the mountains, you're probably going to need quite a lot of recovery time before you do the race you're training for. But a back-to-back weekend, we say that to people over and over again. That's that's the only way you are going to be able to prepare yourself for this. And you did right. You know, you, you may be weren't quite prepared for three days in the Caribbean sunshine but who was going to be what you were prepared for was the worst case scenario and that really could have happened yeah definitely that that gale that came through at the end of stage one could have been the beginning of a drop in temperature of 10 degrees and it hammering it down and raining sideways for the next two days absolutely and and then going back to where we are you know in terms of the terrain that we we put ourselves onto we we found the, the Welsh steep hills, you know, and, and we, we did it on, on the big final training weekend that we, we were on. We flogged our way up over the Carnadai in, in Snowdonia, big ascents, big steep descents, technical descents mm-hmm. as well. And then having got to our, our halfway point where we could quite happily both have we both wanted absolutely to quit. jacked it in. <laughs> we then went up over the glider eye as well um, and then flogged our way back down to Kapalkurig. And it, it was it was beneficial for, for two reasons. Having, having had that option of quitting, neither of us took it. And, and that came in on the final day when we had the option of going all the way to the summit yeah. and then coming yeah. down. So we, we, we had that choice. We didn't quite know that was going to play out that way, but it, it was beneficial. Um, the technical ground, that was, that was very, very similar in, in terms of what we experienced in the event. And personally, having done all of that, when we got to Scotland, nothing felt unfamiliar. I mean, it felt Mm. bigger and it felt, it felt um, just as much of a challenge, but it didn't feel unfamiliar. And because we'd got that familiarity with the type of terrain that we were going on, that gave me as, I mean, I always say that I'm not a runner, you know, I'm someone who does running. 
uh, it gave me some confidence that I had a, a fighting chance of going from A to B and then all the way around the, the rest of the, the three days and doing it. Well, I, when, when we'd done that first day, I, I didn't even consider not finishing because it, because nothing felt unfamiliar. That's brilliant. I mean, you have, you've mentally prepared yourself there. If you get there and the conditions aren't as bad as they were in training, yeah. brilliant. Everything you did was a bonus. And it, it saves you from that feeling that you can get on a start line. Or, you know, we said during one of these events, you get your nights to reset and you can feel better when you wake up the next morning. You could also feel a lot worse. Yeah. You know, your emotions are magnified by 10 when when you are this sleep and calorie deprived and, and in one of these events, what you've just taken away from yourself is that feeling of being overwhelmed, mm. which which can be crippling in, yeah. in a multi-day event or in or in any day. If if you are standing at the start line thinking, This is bigger than me and I and I really I don't feel like this is possible. I don't feel equipped for it. You're much more likely to run into trouble. You you guys gave yourselves the best fighting chance. And I yeah. really hope people are listening to this and, and thinking, yeah, like I, I, I want to model my training. Yeah, around I, that I, honestly, I do think we did because, because it, it was something so far out of the norm for us. Mm. It really was. And we knew, like, I remember when, I, when, when I said to Rich, Oh, do you fancy this? Like your initial reaction was, no, that's way too long, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that, you, you look at the, the numbers and you look at the elevation, you look at stats. You, and you were like, go, no. You go, not a chance. No, this, this is for proper ultra people. That's what I felt like when you started describing a half Ironman to me. <laughs> like, I, I, <laughs> but I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so so then, so you'd have, Rich, you'd be like, uh, no, that's, no, 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 that, that's way too, like, that's way too long. And then you'd have me who's sort of, oh, but that sounds quite good fun. However, I could cr I can crumble in the cold, and when I'm hungry, I am I'm just horrendous. Mm. Um, and and so we did have to come up with a way of preparing ourselves and trying to tick all of those boxes. And we did regular updates um, on like on the podcast and things like that. And I think people have have known you've actually trained really hard for this mm. and. Yeah, we haven't come from that ultra running background, but put the work in, have a plan, thoroughly prepare. Rich was like on it in terms of kit and making sure that we had the right stuff, which was, you know, lightweight, but everything like that. And I think we did feel when we got to Inverie on that first morning, we got the boat over, like we arrived knowing unless something goes badly wrong, we can do this. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And H mentioned the kit. You know, you've got the mandatory kit list that, that you guys supply. But again, everything within that, you know, we we took it seriously, looking looking for things that would fulfil the brief, but whilst, you know, still being lightweight and packable and, and all the rest of it. And hand on heart, there was genuinely nothing in my pack, you know, that I would not pack again. There were, there were things we didn't use, clearly. Some of the, the mandatory waterproofs and all of those kind of things were yeah. completely unnecessary. But, you know, had the conditions been different, we would have we would have lived in them pretty much for three days. Yeah. But genuinely, hand on heart, all of the stuff that we packed, um, I, I would pack again. And I, I was really happy with, you know, the, the pack weights that we achieved and all the rest of it. And so job done there as well. I mean, firstly, I'm taking a couple of sound bites from that to play to the next person who complains about how long our kit list is. So thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> we really do know the course in the area and we have given you a list there that we think would help you survive if it was yeah. non-Caribbean conditions for three days out in the hills. Um, but also that it, it taps into another part of this, which maybe your background in try helps you prepare for as well, which is mm. so much of the training for one of these events is kit research. Mm. Oh. It really is. Well, you know what? Um, I thought that triathlon was bad for kit until <laughs> until we did this and then i was like oh it's not there's nothing to compare oh that's interesting because i was looking at this thinking you guys have got to know like about bits on bikes you know and like that's rich uh, oh yeah yeah fair enough but you know, i mean you, the, you've... The, the, again the crossover is organization in, in a triathlon you need to have like for your transitions you need to have things laid out where you can find your shoes or you know yeah. you've got to be organized you've got to be organized yeah. and, and that organization played out into the ultra as well so 
not just organized in, in your pack, but when you come in off the trail, organized in terms of what do I need to do first? Right, I need to look after my feet. Okay, get my feet dry, get them clean and tidy, put put dry socks and either your same trainers on or, or your, your camp shoes, then sort out your food, then sort out getting your recovery done. And everything has to be organized because otherwise you're gonna make a right hash of it and you, you're gonna to come to a, a very abrupt stop. Uh, absolutely true uh, i you know we we have our race out in the arctic and i've i've said to people before you know you are losing a pair of thick socks away from being out of this race Ooh. you know it, your your admin has to be on it mm. you are mislaying your gloves away from not being allowed out of the next checkpoint mm -hmm. so you, you so much of what you have to prepare yourself for in those kinds of events is is research and having a system yeah. for your admin yeah, and reminding yourself no matter how deep in the pain cave you are <laughs> that you need to go back through that checklist and make sure you've got everything ready because you're gonna have to do this again tomorrow yeah yeah i agree yeah. and that was the most demoralizing thing because you arrive at imbari with this beautifully packed bag and then, <laughs> and then you have to do a kit check and everything explodes onto the floor of the village hall and, you're like, oh, and then you've got to pack it here. up again because we've got somebody else queuing for a kit check. So <laughs> <laughs> then you've got no time. Yeah, I get that. Uh, um, no, that's good. I, I, I do find that interesting that that's, that's something that you guys were familiar with, this being prepared for the admin and having a system and, and sticking to it because it, it, it is definitely something that translates into the ultra running scene. You've got to be on your admin. It's no one else is going to do it for you. Massively, massively. And like just one sort of analogy back to um, triathlon, um, Ironman Wales in 2017, the weather was horrific. Like you really could not have asked for worse weather. It was awful. And it goes back to what you're saying. Like if I had gone out on that bike in just a cycling top, like a t-shirt, I would have not finished that bike leg because I would have got hypothermia. And it's then about going through, right, what do I need to take? What do I need to have on me? I need to be drinking more, eating more because it's colder. So I'm going to be burning more calories, rah, 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 rah. And it comes back to that organization. Definitely brilliant oh with it, that's good we seem to have kind of quite naturally covered there things that you guys did extra in your training to adapt yourselves for an ultra run the the things that you maybe took from try that have helped you be strong and do so well in this event because you guys really did um is there anything that now having done this three-day event what what lessons have you learned during that three days that you would take into the next adventure that, that you do like this? I personally, having said having said the sleep was rubbish, I really am keen to do some cycling with a bit of camping, bivvying in between, I think. So that would be one thing for me. Cool. The other thing, which I alluded to before, is just the fact that this year over winter normally it would be a lot of time on a turbo in the garage at the weekend and then maybe a long run and i loved 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 the variety this year of actually being outdoors and walking and run walking whatever in the hills and so personally i would love to do more of that again next winter it's it's not that it necessarily opened my eyes because I've always liked the outdoors, but I think you can just get into a routine and you're in a comfort zone and it takes something maybe like this to shake it up a bit and go, no, it's okay to do something different. You know, you, you, you don't have to be on the turbo for like two hours every Saturday, get out there, live life. There's more, <laughs> there's more to life than the blooming garage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what about you, Rich? Anything in particular you've learned from this? I, I think it was just a, a really, really good experience. Um, I I like the process of, of going and preparing. I like the I, I like the gear. I you know I, I got a bit geeky about the gear. Let's be honest. <laughs> Um, yeah, one of the one of the funnest parts of it for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah apart from when you then get the bill. <laughs> but, uh... Yes, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would I take from it? Um, I think generally, if, if someone puts a challenge like that in front of you, um, regardless of your initial reaction, which in my case was, oh my God, that's a bloody long way. I'm never going to be able to do that. Um, 
step back from that, look at it, and and I looked at the your promo videos and went, bloody hell, Noida is a stunning place. Um, right, we've got this on the table. Let's actually go and make this happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, if the adventure is there, then yeah, embrace it because it was such a good experience. It was it was really really good and. And that whole preparation, execution, and then reflection afterwards. I look back on some of the photos that that your guys were taking on on all those days, and I look at them and go, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. Let's <laughs> just put a big smile on my face. You guys are giving me so many sound bites to play to potential customers going forward. So, you know, I'm <laughs> happy about that. Um, Excellent. That, that I and do the, want to stress the at this point, these will. guys aren't on commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah fine, yeah, yeah. we're happy. But we'll, with, we'll put our invoice in. Yeah, yeah. but honestly, <laughs> with, with, with these sound bites and the Caribbean-like videos, you've got it nailed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, well, uh, it, Rich, I'm aware that we're going to lose you in a second because yes, you've actually got another afraid. meeting to get off to. Um, so thanks very much for talking to us about no, the race. I, I'm going to pick Helen's brains a little bit about the Inside Tri Show a bit more now, but Thanks very much, Rich. I'm really glad you had a great experience in Thanks, Will. No worries. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Okay. We can carry on. We can carry on. I've never done this before. That's a weird feeling, just dismissing a guest <laughs> halfway bye. through a show. <laughs> yeah. See you, <it>, Rich. <laughs> we could say anything about him now. Yeah, he was a nightmare. might never go back and listen Honestly, to this. Honestly, as a partner, it, what a nightmare to have to do it with him. It was dreadful. Did he snore in the tent? No, that was me. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, jokes aside, um, I think we're very fortunate that we could actually do that together. And and, and perhaps from doing the, like I was saying, those long multi-day cycle things that we've done, and it would just be self-supported, Rich and I. And I, I guess initially, you know, you have to learn, I need all the food. I need all the food. Rich can carry on without the food. So... I need to say, I have to stop rather than internalize it or go, why the hell is he not stopping? So having yeah. gone through all of that previously, like, I guess, again, we got to Scotland knowing that actually we do work really well together. Like as a team, there were no tiffs. It was, it was great. Really good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. If you are listening to the rest of the podcast, then <laughs> it's, it's not gone so badly for you. Um, <laughs> No, delightful. Um, okay, so we've talked about the Highland Ultra quite extensively now. Let's let's talk a little bit about Helen Murray of the Inside Try Show. Uh, this it. is always a nerve wracking experience for me, and I, people will have heard me say this before. Yeah. Having another podcast host on my podcast yes. is horrifying because Why? you seem to have better microphones than me. You know, <laughs> you don't stumble over your words. I don't oh, get I do. time to think. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, well, there's a reason I don't put everything on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, fair enough uh, it, I think well uh, but you know it's a pleasure to have you here and I also really do look forward to the high sound quality I get from when I'm interviewing somebody who has their own podca uh, podcast so that's that's great as we said before sometimes I'm having to edit up audio that it's been somebody shouting into an iPhone in an echoey corridor at the back of their office or whatever so they, no, you're, you know. you're, you're safe here usually usually you can't see this but normally I would have two cushions behind my computer again to just take some more of that sound but i'm afraid i didn't do that today <laughs> so it might freak witch out a little bit <laughs> <laughs> oh well that's quite all right you, you, you honestly it's already like you're performing magic here i can hear you clearly it's wonderful um i guess that's the audio technical geekery done with for the benefit of anyone who came here to listen to an ultra running show um so uh, helen murray of the inside tri podcast yeah. this is this is a good opportunity for me to tap into the mindset of somebody who is in a scene that rubs up against the one that oh, I yeah. spent the last few years in, but it doesn't cross over that neatly. Like I, I get people at our camps before races and I look and there'll be the odd one here and there with an Iron Man tattoo on their calf or, yeah. or something like that. But it seems to be something that ultra runners go off and make a foray into and then, and then come back again. What, how did you get into try? Where did this begin for you? Like, were you were you yeah. a sporty youth, or yeah, is it something you so, came to later? I guess so. Yes, I was always um, I was always a sporty child, really, um, and I did everything. I think tennis was probably my favourite, but I could 
run. I could not sprint, but I could always carry on. So at school, primary school, I would be the one, like the teacher would sort of put me down first for, you know, 800 meters, 1500 meters. So running was always my thing. And I didn't get into triathlon until like mid to late twenties. And that was because I was working in London at the time. I think I had seen these things, but I was doing a lot of running and I had started doing some trail running at that point. But basically I was on my way to work on my mountain bike. <laughs> it wasn't even, a, you know, it wasn't a decent bike. Fell off my bike, hurt my knee, went to a physio and he was like, well, you can't run anymore. You can't swim. Oh, sorry, you can't run. You can't bike. The only thing you can do is swim. And I was like, oh damn, swimming's so boring. Okay, yeah. I need a goal at the end of this. And that was, I entered a triathlon knowing that, right, if I'm going to be swimming, I need to be swimming for a reason. So that was it. 2011 got into the triathlon. I would say sort of drunken bets probably made me enter, (laughs) definitely made me enter a half Ironman. Um, And the other deal of the other side of the bet, if I went to do that, my friend had to come and do a cross country ski marathon with me. Oh, Oh. wow. (laughs) Oh, there's a whole other area of endurance sports. (laughs) So he did come and do this cross-country ski marathon with me. I did that. And then I had to go and um, enter this half Ironman. And I think we knew that before we even did that half Ironman, it was like, we're so doing an Ironman next year, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was it, really. Um, But even within all of that... I was still doing trail running. So I would have done a lot of the endurance life coastal marathons and or like coastal half marathons. I think I started with the 10 K and would have worked my way up. And I think, did I do my first ultra maybe in like 2014? Again, one of theirs coastal stuff. So I had done long runs, but I had never done this back to back thing. Fair enough. So the running, running as a discipline, not entirely alien to you. But nope. what what is it that attracted you to the idea of doing an event like this instead of the sort of tri events that you've obviously been so you've gravitated towards yeah. so much for so long now? Yeah. Well, I I think that's it though. I think I had really got into a a bit of a routine, a bit of a groove, but with triathlon. But I also think that I had probably overtrained. I probably hadn't looked after my body all that well I had injuries and I remember after I mentioned Ironman Wales earlier that after Ironman Wales I basically had a a sort of a stress fracture and I was like oh (laughs) this isn't great so I basically I think after that kind of took a bit of a step back from being quite so competitive um but I've always liked I've just always liked endurance stuff really really liked it I I enjoy the challenge of it all I enjoy the training for it and I guess I enjoy the lifestyle it you know I get up I go swimming it makes me feel good and then I can carry on with my work for the day so I think I love a challenge and when you know when it was on the table do you want to do the Highland Ultra sounds good yep I'm game I'm up for it brilliant well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're the best kind of punter for us. You're just someone who wants the challenge this in the first place. I want, I want the challenge. I'm up for the challenge. And like I say, I was in, in a way, I think it's quite easy to get quite boring as a triathlete. Like always doing the same thing. It's almost like winter training can get quite repetitive and similar. And it was just the best way it was almost like throwing a kind of bomb into a triathlon training plan and just mixing it up and it was great it was so refreshing oh how exciting yeah i i I can picture that you know i i know when i was training for the ice ultra which is a few years Mm. ago now people thought i was insane of a sunday morning when i was strapping my kit on and heading out in weather that would have them not leaving the house for the next 24 hours and and i'd I'd be out doing seven or eight hours Mm. on my own in the hills Mm. and i mean i'm not going to wrap this up there's a smugness that comes with that (laughs) there is there is a feeling when you are standing on a whip windswept hilltop somewhere in the middle of the peaks and you've barely seen another soul in two hours and 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 you've 
got your kit right yeah and you've done your admin right and you've kept all your ducks in a row and and done this awesome thing right in the midst of all those horrible conditions and it very quickly comes to a point where you actually quite look forward to the bad weather (laughs) it doesn't bother you it becomes part of the challenge yeah um yeah so I'm, i'm really glad to hear that sort of something that you've experienced as well yeah. is it, it, it then becomes self-perpetuating because it's not really even training when you're going out and doing these weekends up in the hills you just want to be there anyway totally you're you're almost training by osmosis by accident yeah yeah um, and and i i i still you know like i was saying i do really enjoy the training and there was a stage where i was probably quite competitive i was very competitive and then i don't know i got like anemic and then I suddenly slowed down a lot so I couldn't be competitive and this has been such a treat (laughs) to throw that out the window and just almost be in it for the enjoyment yeah I I can understand that but Mm. I think also and I you can tell me here if it's if it's a similar thing in the tri scene but there's a real understanding in in the ultra scene that because you are out in these really difficult conditions, there are levelers. Mm. Everybody's climbing the same hills. Yep. Everybody is in the same low temperatures and getting rained on as much as everybody else. The guys that are finishing a stage in four or five hours, that's a challenge. That's very intense, yep. very short period of time, an awful lot of work they've done. But then the guys in the mid pack who maybe took eight or nine hours to finish, they spent a lot more time in those tough conditions. Yep. And they were probably working at a similar effort level to the guys at the front as well the guys at the back it's a herculean effort to mentally keep yourself moving when when you are going much slower than everybody else and you're in the conditions for even longer than them and you've got less time to reset each night that really the guys at the front and the guys in the back there's a lot of mutual respect oh, because massively. although you're having different experiences, it's hard across the board. Yeah. And when those stories get shared across the campfires at the end of each stage, you, you really get that kind of mutual respect for each other. And I like that. It sort of it doesn't matter if you're on the podium or not. It's great if you are. Yeah. You're more likely to pick up a sponsor. But that's ultimately, everyone's getting something out of the experience. Oh, absolutely. And and it, it is exactly the same in, you know, in, in triathlon. I have so much respect for the professionals who do it as a living and how they do it day in day out they don't even know what day of the week it is because their weeks just morph into one Wow! and then yeah you go to the other end and maybe someone has crossed the line of an Ironman with a minute to spare so they've been out there for like 16 hours and 59 minutes and it's it's just phenomenal it really is phenomenal and i think you can take so much from from all of that it, it's ace it sounds like a lot of the positives you get out of mm. the people involved in the the scene that you're more familiar mm. with are, are similar to what i get from mine yeah is and i would guess then that that's part of what's kept you attached to try for such a long time you've been like a spokesperson for this scene for for a long while now in one way shape or form what I guess. what led to you being a podcaster in in that scene yeah so it was um a a, a a coach um in 2014 said to me helen do you want to do a podcast with me so i was like yeah okay so my background is actually in broadcasting um i worked for the i worked for bbc sport and like used to work in local radio and things like that so i guess i kind of get the talking to people and the audio and the editing and all things like that. So I was like, yeah, all right. Sounds, sounds good. And at that time, cause it wasn't really popular. I could get away with it when I was still working at the BBC. <laughs> it wasn't a conflict of interest or anything like that. So, so that's how I started. Did that podcast for five years. And then I jumped ship and decided to do my own. Um, and I, like you say, I love triathlon. I try to really make it about triathlon and other stuff. So, you know, people have been hearing about all of our training for the ultra. For me, it's very much about the person that I'm interviewing. It is, yeah, we've been playing like snippets of Rich and I, but it's not about me. You know, when I'm interviewing someone, I am listening so, so much and I get a lot of pleasure out of, hearing other people's stories 
telling other people's stories. Like I really do. And again, that goes back to the broadcasting thing and the and the journalism and stuff. And so I, I really love doing it. It gives me the broadcasting fix. It keeps me motivated from the people that I interview. Um, it presents new challenges. So yeah, the Highland Ultra, but then also I did a whole episode about swim run, which is basically swimming and like you swim in your trainers and then you run in your wetsuit and you're literally transitioning between the two. And I've got an event to look forward to in June. And and again, it's something awesome. fresh, it's something different. I, ca- I can't wait. So yeah, I love doing the podcast and the people that I interview and the listeners as well that, that listen, like that's what makes it. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. I completely agree. Yeah. I, 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 it's something that I think I mentioned to you when I was recording that um, interview in Inverate yeah. is that I think it surprises people that I, I'm still terrified of doing this. Like I, I am nervous every time somebody mm. sticks me in front of a microphone mm. and every time I get a new person sitting in front of me yeah. um, to interview on the podcast, I do. I'm still nervous as anything but I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know so badly what it is that that drove them to do whatever challenge it was they did and what they got out of it. And I, I really think that just as there's been a huge amount of benefits for me, the more I have learned from mm-hmm. these people, I just want to tell that story. I just want to give them a platform totally. to tell that story so that anyone listening to it can feel as inspired as I do oh. by them. Because I do. Yeah. I'd do this if we had no listeners. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like... I don't know who who have I interviewed. So people like a ninety-one year old nun. I mean, honestly, like, yeah, your your look there, look a surprise. Um, so she's like the oldest Ironman athlete in the world, or, or whatever. Or yeah, that that's what she is. But I mean, what a privilege to be able to speak to someone like that, or um, Lucy Bartholomew, an ultra runner from Australia, or mm. someone like Mimi Anderson. And Lowry Morgan, like I had them on together. They were absolutely hilarious. So just people like that, like I did, I interviewed them on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. You could not ask to get your week off to a better start than having those two in front of you, just chatting away with each other, cracking me up. Absolutely. You know, a lot of my week, a lot of the time working behind the scenes Mm -hmm. with the races I do is, you know, I'm mangling spreadsheets today for registration paperwork at our next event. I'm a lot of it is logistics mm. and some of it's quite tough and there's always a lot of it to do. I have a podcast interview in the middle of the day and that's it. Yeah. That's what I remember from the day. Is <laughs> it and it it buoys you. It I I feel better about everything else that I do every time I've recorded an episode. Totally. I'm including this one in that Helen. Thank yeah. you. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Thanks. No worries. No, You're it, welcome. I, I the other issue is I like talking, as you can probably tell. Uh, yeah, I really like talking, so that always helps. Uh, yeah, I regularly have to remind myself on the podcast to shut up. I, I can start asking a question and then look across at the waveform, the little squiggly line on my recording software next to me and realize it's just been me talking for a solid five minutes now. I'm like, yeah, I've got to stop. Um, but yeah, I, I feel your pain. I know exactly yeah. what you mean there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is it. For anyone who came here for Endurance Sports News, it's now just two podcasters geeking out about <laughs> talking about how podcasting works. <laughs> you, and I'm not even sorry. <laughs> you can have this. Yeah. I'd, I I got to ask then, who have been... You? I mean, you've mentioned a couple of guests there mm. who sound like they were absolutely phenomenal. Mm. And I, uh, it, it, it's difficult to pick favourites, but are, are there any that really stand out? Any people you spoke to that you came away from thinking... I'm I'm like part of a percent different to when I went into this interview and yeah. spoken to this person. Yeah. So there's a guy called Luke Grenfellshaw. And Luke Grenfellshaw is a good age group triathlete, but he uh, was diagnosed with stage four cancer in his early 20s. However, he is a can liver. And um, I just will always remember the words that he he said, which is very much about living life and you can choose how you live today. And he is, well, he's just got back to the UK actually, but he set off from Bristol on a tandem with the, he was doing Bristol to Beijing on a tandem. Uh, 2020, he set off, so the very, so January, and then obviously like there's been COVID and everything like that. Anyway, he has reached China, 
but can't get into China because of COVID. And he's uh, going to complete his Bristol to Beijing bike ride on a turbo trainer in London. So the, the distance that he would have cycled across China, he's going to do on a static yeah, bike in London. And anyway, I, I just think he really did make an impact on me about control how you live today. That, that was his words, control how you live today. Wow. Yeah. Well, there you go. For, for any of my listeners who are looking for some inspiration and are sick of the sound of my voice, you should definitely, definitely go over and find the Inside Try Show. Because yeah. I mean, as you said, it's not like you only talk to try people and no. only about, you know, getting your bike transition oh, faster. No, no. I'm sure there is some of that. but I, I'm not very good at doing that part of it. To. Honestly, Will, I'm not very good at doing that part of it. I'm all about the, like the story behind the person. So yeah, it might be... Um, I don't know, Olympic champion Gwen Jorgensen or something like that. But no, I'm sort of like, oh, what makes you tick, Gwen? That's me. And there's and there's obviously the episode all about the Highland Ultra as well. Yeah, you should definitely go and listen to that. It features uh, Will. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. Uh, <laughs> I mean, by all means, do go and listen to it. But it features a number of other people too. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I really enjoyed it, actually. It's... Um, it's an unusual experience for me, really, to get so much insight into a runner's experience of an event that I've been working behind the scenes on. Yeah. You know, we, we get feedback and we, we have quick chats with people, yeah. but to to hear all the ins and outs of your training process all the way through it, of, of each stage of the event, and then to talk to you the morning after you mm. finished it and do that little 10 minute interview there when, when it was still you know, fresh. fresh in your minds and fresh on your faces, you know, you, you literally just got over the line. And I, yeah, that's, it's just been a really interesting experience from our point of view as well, mm. getting this real inside look into what happens in one of our own races. Yeah. Yeah. Which seems bonkers, but no, I can yeah, get this... it though, because you wouldn't see that each of you would not have that overall bigger picture of the whole thing necessarily. No. Um, and that's what that that's what I really tried to do with that episode was actually paint this massive canvas picture of the whole thing. So it's not, I mean, you only hear about Rich and I at the end. It's not about Rich and I. You hear from Chris, you hear from John, who set the course, you hear all about the logistics of it. You've got the first timers, like one from America, like what the hell's he doing in Scotland? All that kind His of first stuff. Ever trip to Europe. <laughs> what a, what a dream of a trip. Unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, lovely. But yeah, I, I highly recommend anyone listening to this go and listen to um, the Inside Try Show on the Highland Ultra because it's really interesting. But also just go back through some of their guests because there's some really inspiring stuff in there. Um, and Helen, I'm not going to lie, puts together a more polished podcast than I do. <laughs> So go and soak up those silky audio vibes, um, which which I don't provide for you. I'm I'm oh. desperately sorry, everything endurance listeners. Uh, yeah, excellent. Well, it, look, I I've pretty much exhausted the scrappy notes I wrote in my uh, on my notebook before we started this. Love it. Um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Helen. It's been a pleasure to be here as well. Will, thank you so so much yeah no worries um have an amazing rest of your day and hopefully we'll uh talk to you after some other monstrous thing you've done oh, in the future definitely definitely that'd be cool cheers well excellent no worries okay bye for now <laughs>